Welcome to the MediContour First Q's uh, lunchtime symposium on the add-on intraocular lenses. My name is uh, Satish Srinivasan. I'm from Scotland. It's a great pleasure to introduce my friends and colleagues, Dr. Kel Gunderson from Norway and Dr. Joachim Fernandez uh, from Spain. So we'll be sharing our experiences about this uh, niche product and we'll be quite happy to take questions at the end of the three talks. Uh, before I get started, can I get a show of hands on how many uh, have used add-on or piggyback or secondary IOLs? Okay, not many. So hopefully we'll be able to uh, give you some science and some clinical results and the rationale be behind using this. So I'm going to do the first talk in the next 15 to 20 minutes. I'll talk a little bit about the history, the nomenclature, design and developments, indications and surgical techniques for using this uh, very niche product. Uh, all this started back in the 1980s uh, when uh, Johnny Gayton, who was a pediatric ophthalmologist in the US, uh, wanted to implant, was doing cataract surgery in a very uh, uh, child who was extremely hyperopic, and at that time, IOL manufacturers did not have a single intraocular lens. So he decided to put, use two, uh, two intraocular lenses. Uh, this is a small eye with micro-ophthalmic eye. So these were two lenses which were originally designed to be put in the bag. Both of them were put inside the capsular bag uh, as a piggyback. Uh, and one was a high-powered planar convex lens in the capsular bag, uh, and the other one was uh, facing anteriorly so that uh, both could fit the space uh, in, the in the capsular bag. So once this started, a few years later, about four or five years later, a new, a new complication started coming up in the literature, which was called uh, interpseudophagous lens opacification, or in short, called ILO, which is called interlenticular opacification. This was further reported by Nick Mamelis and his group from Salt Lake City, Utah as well. So I just want to walk you through this uh, anatomy so that we understand what happens. That's the capsular bag, which is pretty much designed to have only one intraocular lens. So if you put two intraocular lenses within the capsular bag, these uh, lens epithelial cells literally don't have any space to go around to form the traditional posterior capsular pacification. So they started sec getting sequestered between these two optical surfaces and they started producing this uh, uh, opaque uh, uh, membrane between these two intraocular lenses which was later called uh, interlenticular opacification. Uh, these are pictures courtesy of Liliana Werner from the Salt Lake City uh, uh, laboratory where she works with Nick Mamelis. These are explanted piggyback lenses. Both were put in the capsular bag and you can see that interlenticular opacification ca causing significant loss of best corrected vision. Then people started realizing putting two lenses in the bag was not that a great idea. This is once again example showing how the lens epithelial cells grow between the two intraocular lenses to produce uh, ILO. So then start, people started using putting one lens in the bag and putting a second lens which was designed to be implanted in the bag, but they were started implanting in the sulcus. From David uh, Apple's work, we all realized that square edge is an important factor to reduce uh, posterior capsule opacification. So if you put a square edged lens, either hydrophilic or hydrophobic, uh, designed to be put in the capsular bag, and if you put them in the sulcus, this square edge starts rubbing against the posterior iris pigment epithelial layer, and invariably, as the time goes on, you'll start developing uh, pigment dispersion syndrome, uh, which will cause iris transsublimination defects, and you'll, patients will eventually end up getting secondary pigment dispersion glaucoma. This is once again, uh, thanks to Liliana Werner's uh, uh, courtesy for providing me these uh, lenses. So these are lenses, one lens was put in the bag, which was no issues. The second lens, which was designed to be put in the bag, which is a standard three-piece, square-edged, sharp optic lens, put in the sulcus, which has been explanted. And once again, you can see all the iris pigment epithelial cells, not only on the lens surface, but also causing uh, iris transillumination defects and secondary glaucoma. So then we all realized that we need a new design for lenses. We cannot use square-edged lens, square lenses, which are primarily designed to be put in the bag, put them in the sulcus, because invariably, at some point in the lifetime, these patients will develop secondary pigment dispersion syndrome or glaucoma. Uh, so then the ophthalmologists started working with the industry. Then we have all realized we have to design special lenses which are primarily indicated to be used only as a piggyback or, a second, or, or as a secondary intraocular lens option, which are specifically designed to be inserted in the sulcus. So for a lens to be inserted into the sulcus, we need to follow some ground rules. One, the lens has to be hydrophilic because of the biocompatibility properties. 
the lens has to be designed in a convex concave or, or, uh, configuration. I'll show you more pictures of that so that uh, it doesn't touch the primary IOL in the capsular bag. So which also requires a special uh, haptic angulation. And most importantly, single most important factor, none of these lenses should not have a square edge because you need a smooth, uh, unpolished surface, which is rounded. If it's a square edge, it will start chafing against the posterior iris pigment epithelium. So this is the primary design of uh, a secondary intraocular lens, which are designed to be placed in the sulcus. Once again, you can see the side profile. These lenses have a plain, plain oak convex concave con configuration so that it doesn't come anywhere in touch. The, both the optics don't match, uh, don't touch each other, even though they are separated uh, by the rim of the anterior capsule. They are posteriorly angulated so that they are well away from the uh, posterior iris pigment epithelium. And most importantly, the material is hydrophilic and they don't have a square edge. So that's the model any companies have to follow if they're going to have specially designed lenses to be placed within the uh, uh, ciliary sulcus. So coming on to the add-on lens, which is designed uh, and uh, marketed by First, First Q uh, and Medicontour, these, as I said, are specifically designed only to be placed in the ciliary sulcus, not in the capsular bag. It has got a four-point haptic fixation. Once again, we all know that the ciliary sulcus diameter is very variable. It's not round, it's oval, and it varies with the anatomy of the eye. So you need a haptic, which is quite flexible, which can stretch to have a wider ciliary space. If the ciliary space is smaller, it can flex enough so that it doesn't cause any tilt. So that's the point of this four-point fixation. You've got a non-torque design, which is very crucial when you start putting in toric uh, uh, optics on these platforms. Once again, it's got a square design, but not a square edge. Let me clarify on that. The reason for the square design is it's got a, a huge, large optic footprint, so there's no iris capture. We have talked about this concave, convex configuration, so there is no IOL optic touch between the primary IOL in the capsular bag and the secondary IOL in the sulcus. And I'll show you, which is a quite straightforward surgical procedure, well within the skill sets of an anterior segment surgeon. You don't have to learn any new surgical techniques to do this. And one of the greatest advantages is the very last bullet point, which I've highlighted, which is the reversibility of this. Once again, I'll show you how that kind of options will come into play. So before we all this started about five years ago, uh, in collaboration with Nick Mamlis and Liliana Werner, we set up a human cadaver study. We wanted to look at how these lenses anatomically sit. So we took about 15 human cadaver eyes, all our post uh, uh, cataract surgery, which are all pseudophagic eyes, and we, uh, we cut them in the equator, and people have uh, utilized or familiar with this Apple Mayaki view. This is the best way to visualize the capsular bag. So this is an operating microscope on the top and an inverted camera at the bottom, and you've got this uh, little uh, uh, holder where you can place the equator of the globe, which has been uh, uh, dissected. So this is the view. Imagine yourself, you're lying on the retina, and you're looking at the capsular bag. So this is the view from inside out. So these are different kinds of lenses we uh, took. We deliberately took pseudophagic uh, human cadaver eyes, which has got a plate haptic, which has got a three-piece, single piece. So these are, this is example shows you the 360 degree, the iris has been removed. So this is 360 degree ciliary processes showing a single plate haptic intraocular lens within the capsular bag. In this example, obviously, it was not a great cataract surgery. You can see a lot of cortical remnants left behind, but this is a three-piece uh, IOL uh, in the capsular bag. So we started implant, taking this cadaveric eyes and implanting this first Q add-on lenses. Once again, the picture on your very left-hand side shows the position of this haptic within the ciliary uh, sulcus space. And this haptic gives you that flexibility to either stretch or to flex, depending on the anatomy of the ciliary sulcus. And we did anterior segment OCT pictures of this. This is the Visante anterior segment OCT. Uh, just to give you uh, uh, the orientation, the cornea has been removed, the iris has been uh, uh, removed. You just see some iris remnants here. And that's the primary IOL in the capsular bag. That's the secondary first Q add-on in the ciliary sulcus. And you can put a digital caliper and actually measure the space uh, between the primary IOL in the back and the secondary IOL in the sulcus. And once again, in this example, very nicely shows that the convex concave uh, configuration of the secondary add-on lenses gives you a nice space, so there is no physical contact. Uh, and we showed that these lenses are very, very stable, irrespective of the type of primary IOL in the capsular bag. Uh, doesn't matter whether it's a plate haptic in the bag or a single piece in the bag or a three piece in the bag. The most important uh, 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 issue to consider 
is clinically whether the bag IOL complex is stable because that's the template on which these lenses are going to sit. So if the patient had had complicated cataract surgery, there is zonular loss, and if the primary IOL is tilted in the capsular bag, then these, are not, these could be potentially contraindications for considering uh, these uh, lenses. Uh, just to give you the uh, um, flavor of these uh, uh, add-on options, it not only comes in a spherical component, you can put a toric uh, uh, optic onto it. Now you've got a trifocal uh, optic onto it. You can put a trifocal toric op uh, optic onto it. So it gives you a lot of uh, flexibility uh, and uh, th that's where the reversibility comes into uh, uh, play when we talk about these indications for these patients. So th I'll stop this video here. So this is a patient of mine. Uh, who came in for a refractive lens exchange, uh, had a, a trifocal intraocular lens bilaterally. The one eye was fine. The second eye, four weeks later, developed capsular back distension syndrome. You can see just about, you'll see, or when I play this video, you'll see, I did a YAG laser posterior capsulotomy to drain the fluid. Patient had a myopic shift. Unfortunately, six months later, that didn't, the, uh, the IOL was pushed forward. It never went back into position. The patient had a myopic residual shift. And so it was six, seven months down the line, we discussed various options, either treating it with the laser, uh, either with P LASIK or PRK, and patient elected to go uh, with a secondary add-on. So this is uh, putting an add-on lens to purely correct the refractive error of this patient. Uh, I think I remember this was a toric. You'll see in the video, patient was left uh, with about minus 2.75 with a 1.5 cell to correct. So this is, are, this is the surgical technique of putting in a secondary piggyback lens. Now you can clearly see the YAG laser post capsule uh, opening, which I had created to drain the capsular back distension fluid. Unfo unfortunately, it didn't work. So the primary IOL is in the bag. You can see the capsule is fibrosed. It's about seven months down the line. All you need is a clear, co clear corneal 2.2 millimeter uh, incision. And not only you inject the OVD into the anterior chamber, but you deliberately want to inject the OVD into the posterior chamber to inflate the space in the ciliary sulcus. That's the only difference you're going to make. Inject, not only inject the OVD in the AC, but inject the OVD in the PC as well, so that you open up the space because that's the space where these lenses are going into be injected. Uh, and the lens is uh, very, very straightforward, well within the skill sets of doing any cataract surgery. It's the cartridge, uh, um, the take the lens uh, out of the uh, bottle and use any non-toothed forceps. You can see the large six millimeter uh, optic and the four haptics. These are hydrophilic, extremely flexible. So it's like loading any primary uh, capsular bag IOL. All you need to make sure is to tuck the optic into the two narrow uh, rail tracks and make sure all the four haptics are tucked in so that they don't catch uh, the injector system when they go in. So it, it goes through, uh, I'll show you how easily it goes through, and it goes through a self-sealing 2.2 millimeter ins uh, incision, that's the uh, injector system. Make sure that the lens is uh, moving forward comfortably without the haptics being stuck anywhere. Once again, I'm injecting OVD to make sure that I inject the OVD behind the iris to open up the space in the ciliary sulcus. That's the only difference you're going to make, and that's a 2.2 millimeter uh, incision. And you can see a very smooth delivery uh, of this uh, uh, optic. You'll see the initial uh, leading to haptics coming in. And if you open the space uh, uh, well enough, these two haptics can easily uh, go in straight into the space. It's like putting an ICL, if people have used ICL before. So once the two, uh, if they are not tucked in, then it's very easy. As I said, these are very, very flexible haptics. Uh, we can very easily tuck in uh, behind the iris. Uh, the key factor is to make sure that the pupil is very well, uh, very well dilated. Otherwise, it can make uh, things uh, a little tricky. And you can see we are using a monofocal toric uh, in this video to correct that. Once the four haptics are tucked in, the, then it's quite easy to uh, rotate the lens uh, to the two corneal marks, which I have uh, done maybe roughly around 50 or 60 degrees, uh, guessing from where it's looking. So once the lens is placed, then it's pretty stable. Make sure that all the four haptics are tucked in. Uh, and then we are going to do uh, a bimanual IA in this video uh, to remove the OVD. One little caveat which I wanted to give you is you not only want to remove the OVD from the anterior chamber, you want to lift the uh, piggyback lens and remove the uh, OVD which is trapped between the two lenses. Otherwise, I've been caught a couple of times, patient comes in first day with a very high intraocular pressure spike. I hope I show that, there it is. So I'm lifting the uh, uh, add-on lens and then you have to remove the OVD. If you don't do this step, trust me, OVD gets trapped 
and then patient will have a huge intraocular pressure spike. So that's one little extra step. And then I always inject uh, myocol or myostat to make sure that the pupil is constricted, as you can see in this video, make sure there is no iris capture, and that's the end of the procedure. Literally takes five, six minutes to do it well within the skill sets of any of the cataract surgeons. Can we get out of this video to the next slide? Great. So that's the slit lamp view. Once again, I want to illustrate and highlight what this video is showing. This is showing you the third, second and the third Perkunji image. And that little gap, black shadow, which you see here, is highlights that that's the nice convex, concave configuration, showing that the, prime, the secondary IOL in the uh, sulcus, it's not touching the primary optic of the primary IOL in the capsular back. So that's the second Perkunji reflex coming from the add-on lens in the sulcus. That's the per third Perkunji image uh, coming from the primary IOL in the capsular bag. And that little black space reassures you that both these lenses are not touching. It's very similar to the slit lamp you, you will get if you're implanting an ICL. So th this is an online calculator. In the interest of time, I'm going to stop, quickly show you this. This is the online calculator to use to calculate these lenses. All you need is two, three important things to remember. You want refractive stability. You want to wait at least three or four months from the primary operation before you consider that because one of the most important factors we take into account is the manifest refraction of the uh, patient for calculating the IOL power. So you want refractive stability. You want to change your IOL uh, master settings to make sure that you're measuring the pseudophagic axial length, pseudophagic anterior chamber depth, and then you, the K1 and K2. So those are the three important things which we take into account. Good stable manifest refraction, pseudophagic anterior chamber depth, pseudophagic ACD, uh, and then uh, the K1 and K2. If the anterior chamber depth is less than three millimeters, then these patients may not be suitable candidates uh, for having a secondary add-on lens, but it's very, very unlikely that in a pseudophagic eye, you will get an anterior chamber depth less than three millimeters. Usually there is enough space uh, in the anterior chamber. So thank you, I'll stop here. We'll take all the questions at the end. I'll uh, invite Dr. Gunderson to share his presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon um, and welcome to this session. There are still some, some seats uh, in front here, so if you want to avoid standing in the back, I can count directly 10, 15 uh, seats uh, ready for you to, to come. Um, I want to share with you uh, my experience with the first few add-on lenses, indication, patient selection, and clinical results. These are my financial disclosures. And I'm working in my own clinic, uh, doing approximately 2,000 intraocular surgeries per year, and uh, do also have some scientific activities. These are the five publications we have um, published. Um, in this area, so to speak, uh, secondary uh, lenses uh, after refractive misses and other indications. Uh, so my indication for first Q sulcus fixated add-ons, you can divide that um, into two. Um, secondary refractive repair, or, and you can repair your own mistakes and others' mistakes. So spherical error, refractive surprise, torical error, rest astigmatism, and you can also um, treat negative dysphotopsia because you change the, the edge profile within the eye, uh, adding an, a new lens into the system. Then secondary presbyopia treatment. If you have, a, have some patients being operated one, two, five, six, ten years ago, asking for presbyopia treatment, this is a viable option to, 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 uh, to um, offer to them uh, if they are willing to pay the bill. Um, so it's, it's a second chance for my own patients. I do get quite a lot of referrals from colleagues and direct contact from pseudophagic patients um, which have discovered this possibility. Then on the other hand, you can use the same strategy for a planned two-step approach, a basic IOL in a bag and a sulcus fixated add-on, either in the same setting or in separate settings. So. Patients wanting potentially a reversible refraction solution, this is a conservative way of doing it. You have, a, you have an open back door to back out if you need it. Uh, Post-LASIK patients is ob obviously one group of patients where, where you are 
a bit uncertain about the, the, the biometry and how they end up. Um, and then stable keratoconus patients, I would also be an advocate of, of having this as an option for those patients. Post penetrating keratoplastic patients and irregular uh, astigmatism. Although you cannot fully uh, compensate for their complex optics, you can definitely improve it. So now I will also sh only show me you my technique uh, compared to, to um, Satish's technique. I use a 2.75 um, incision size, which sounds too big. But remember, this is a cold incision without any FACO. So you won't treat any astigmatism, you won't induce any astigmatism by doing so. And it gives you a bit more space to, to, to navigate in. And as you will see now, that what you enter, I enter the, the, um, the injector into the eye. I see how the first two haptics coming out, and then I turn the injector slightly downwards and outwards. And if, with a, a bit of training, you, you will have all four haptics behind the iris in one setting. If you have only two or only three, like Satish uh, shown us, it's easy to, 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 to manipulate that in place. But it's always nice to have everything in, in order from the first step. So what about scientific and clinical results? We looked at toric stability because the toric lens I started with, um, uh, the Rainer, uh, worked perfectly in, in, uh, in, in, in spherical cases. But we noticed that in more than 30, 35% of the cases, it rotated when you used it on toric indication. And this is unacceptable. Uh, so in our study, only one eye out of 10, it's a small study, had more than 0 0.75 of residual refractive astigmatism. 70% had less than uh, 0 0.5. Um, and as I said, my initial experience with the Solcoplex had a completely different uh, toric stability. Looking at the plan two-step approach, it can be done like I do it in most cases, same day uh, surgery, or it can be done in, in separate sessions. So up to four IOLs in, uh, being implanted in the same day. It might s sound crazy to some of you uh, who is not uh, used to uh, bilateral simultaneous uh, not simultaneous, uh, sequential uh, surgery, but it's, it's, it's um, um, been done in my clinic and I don't see any large issues with such an approach. It's up to you. So regarding uh, safety, using um, add-ons in more than 300 cases now over a period of more than four years, I've had, let's say, three serious complications which are potentially side-threatening. Two cases of TUS, one being explanted in another institution and one being treated medically only. And then, not more than three uh, months ago, we had one with a very serious IOP spark, maybe because of lost uh, or, or, or not removing the viscoelastic, maybe also due to an inflammatory process, but he had to be hospitalized to get control of the IOP. But I'm happy to tell that all these three patients um, had full visual recovery in all cases. Then we can look at the non-serious and transition episodes. Some cases of IOP spikes, three cases of mild and transient CME, five cases of haptic luxation out of the sulcus, which can be avoided if you do myocall in all cases. I don't. And, but I'm, and I would want to note, no cases of interlenticular opacification, iris shafting or deep pigmentation, or dysphotopsia. So some clinical cases, this is a secondary refractive repair patient, um, the true refractive missed target, based on the fact that um, yeah, we ended up with an effective lens position very deep, six millimeter actually. It was a post-lacing patient, and the post-operative refraction after the initial surgery was around plus two and a half. As I said, a very deep chamber, we added add-ons in both eyes, and it ended up with a very nice refraction. We had space enough in this case. Another case, secondary keratoconus treatment, 50 years, 52 years of age, preoperative refraction, minus four, minus eight, 
and then we to, uh, chose the toric eye wells as, as the primary surgery. Ended up ex ex with an extreme um, better uh, refraction, but still uh, plus one and a half, minus almost five. And then after a uh, successful toric add-on refraction, plus 0 0.5, minus one and a half, and look at the uncorrected visual acuity. Stable keratoconus patients, for them, cataract surgery and other secondary surgeries are really sent from God. Another planned two-step implantation, 56-year-old male, presbyopic, uh, and preoperative refraction uh, and visual acuity of 0 0.5 and 0 0.2, uncorrected near visual acuity. IOL implanted in the bag, uh, plus 24 T3, TOL, and then uh, supplemented by an add-on progressive. A perfect refractive result, one point, uh, more than 1.0 uncorrected distance visual acuity, and the same also for near visual acuity. And the patient was somehow very happy. Then my closing uh, my remarks, take home mes messages, sulcus fixating first Q add-on eye wells, easy to implant and explant. Surgery is sur surgical induced astigmatism uh, neutral because you don't uh, use any FACO, it's a cold incision. Refractive predictability and stability are excellent. Secondary presbyopia treatment represent a huge patient uh, potential and reduced uh, risk of chronic uh, dry eye disease compared to if you fix uh, the refraction of adult patients. If you do a laser, then you have a high risk of inducing a chronic dry eye disease problem, which you can avoid with this, uh, with this, this strategy. And safety and efficacy has been proven to be uh, excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kundersen. I call upon uh, Joaquim Fernandez to do the last presentation and then uh, jot down all your questions. We'll open up uh, discussions for all these three talks and we'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. Well, all the presentation that we are seeing here in the European meeting, in all the rooms, we are focusing in multifocal lens in short-term outcome. You can see it, three months, six months, even one year, not too much more. In the literature, we have the longer uh, follow-up of three focal lenses is only six years. So probably we are losing something in our picture, in the whole picture. It's the very long term of our patient because of the expectation of life could be 85, 90 years old. So I think it's very important to think about that. This is our declaration of interest in this presentation. And we know, all of us know, that we implant uh, multifocal lenses. At, at the beginning, uh, we had too much complaints. Even almost 40% of the, our patient could have, at least in the literature, with some type of uh, complaints. We learned a lot uh, through the years. And right now, we have reduced uh, the people that who need uh, explantation of the multifocal lenses. We have learned a lot, but even right now, we have some amount reported in the literature about the explantation of the multifocal lenses. I am going to show you some cases of patients that we could think about implant or not multifocal lenses, and we are going to see the variability in the outcomes. Look at that, low MLP. In low MLP, do you implant multifocal lenses? Probably yes, probably not, but it's, we have a lot of variability. Look at the patient two and the patient three, the defocus score is quite similar to the median of the population. And you could see, well, with low amblyopy, it could be a good option to implant multifocal lens. But look at this case with the same amount reported in the literature, how reduced dramatically the defocus score of the multifocal lens. So we are going to have a lot of variability. What about, for example, multifocal intercular lens around the MEC after or before? the implant of the multifocal lens. It's quite similar. Look at that, we can see acceptable uh, visual acuity and corrected visual acuity, but there are some other cases with very bad uh, vision after the multifocal lens reported in literature. We can see also some reviews talking about 
the possibility of multifocal lenses in retina disease, okay? The conclusion is the lack of evidence suggesting that that patient with retinal disease should be advised against multifocal lens, but the key could see a multifocal lens should be disadvised in a diabetic patient with a risk of developing macular edema or with macular edema. Well, we have a lack of evidence. So with a lack of evidence, we need to follow the prudence principle, of course. So the idea would be that the, this lack of uh, evidence suggesting that the patient with retina disease should be advised against the multifocal lenses. But for sure, the lack of evidence is because of an ethical reason that avoid to create uh, trials about that. Let's take a look at the possible disease after refractive lens and chain in the long term. Look at that. It's very interesting to see the incidence that you have here in this column, and also the percentage that the patient could lose more than two lines in the corrected distant visual acuity, losing more than two uh, lines of the corrected visual acuity could dramatically reduce the defocus curve of our lenses. It's a lot of possible disease along the years. And it's very interesting also this paper is made with the opinion of a specialist in retina in Korea, is it could be a good idea or not in sun disease to implant a multifocal lenses. You can see here the unclear trend, and we have a lot of disease with unclear. Some doctor tell us, some retina doctor, no anterior segment doctor, retina doctor, could they not have an agreement if we could implant on these people multifocal lenses? Probably in all these cases, could be possible in retina detachment with macula ohm, uh, previous barrier laser to retina breaks, lattice degeneration, but we have some doubt in another cases as you can see here, some specialists in retina tell us that we could and another not. So it's very interesting, it's not too clear. We are talking in all the presentation about the benefit of the reversibility as you are seeing. What could be the complication reported after refractive lesson chains. In this paper, with a huge amount of patients, as you can see here, you can see all the possible complications, even with a normal surgery in the long term of the surgery. Look at that. The situated macular edema with its percentage, the pyretina membrane probably is something that we cannot manage, and another uh, pathology that you need to take at, in, in account. For example, let's take a look in the epithelial retina membrane after multifocal lenses. Patient operated, what could be the visual acuity? And you can see it's very unpredictable. Some people have good visual acuity after the, the surgery, some other not. Again, the possibility of the reversibility could be incredible for us in some cases like that. But let's talk about the retina detachment. We have some relationship on the axial lens. Of course, we know the longer is the eye, the more risk you are going to have. As you can see here, is improving with the axial length of the eye. So in some myopia, for example, above six dioptries, we have to take, but this is without operating the clear lens. But what happened with the retina detachment after cataract surgery? This is the mean follow-up of seven years, only seven years, and we have this percentage. But for core, of course, we know that the cataract surgery could improve the risk of uh, retina detachment. What could be the risk for in improving this risk? Of course, the posterior capsule in these two papers is quite similar, the percentage of posterior capsule for the training surgery. Of course, the age is very interesting to have uh, this idea with patient older of 60 years old, we are going to reduce the risk. It's very interesting to have this age on mine. Interesting, the sex, the male, and um, in both the high myopia. But better than talking about high myopia, it's more interesting to have this figure. The axial length above 23 millimeter, we are going to improve the risk. It's very interesting to know. So finally, we create this algorithm in order to indicate based on the long term, our surgery. If we have around, we, if we have above 60 years old, 
we, we have seen that we are not increasing, at least in the literature, the risk of retinal detachment. But in this age, from 50 to 60, if we have a NOSI is uh, made, it's a parameter made with the HD analyzer, it's a double pass equipment, tell us what could be the transparency of the crystalline. You could do it also with a trace, you could do it also with a pentacam. We are going uh, to present a poster about that. But if we have a transparent crystalline with this uh, parameter, this is cutoff of OPSI, we could do, we could go to a cornea refractive surgery, probably with presbylasic or probably with um, monovision overall with uh, a smile and with thinking about the dry eye. We could also go to the ACL in both uh, hand, or monovision targeting minus 1.5 in the non-dominant eye, in, in sensorial non-dominant eye, or probably we could go to the new Evo B by Dove, but if we have not transparency with a parameter more than 1.25, if we have short eye, we have seen that there's no any risk of retinal detachment, we can implant a multifocal lens in the capsular bag, but we were thinking about large eye, or probably we are thinking about in the long term some risk of DC, we are implanting a monofocal in the capsular bag and a multifocal in the add-on, thinking about the uh, benefit of the reversibility of these lenses. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Joachim. I think we'll open up the, uh, for questions. There are two mics on either side, so feel free to come up to the microphone if you have any questions. Or if you have a good voice, please shout, either. I have a question about pediatric cataract. Uh, Ed Wilson wrote about it 20 years ago. What Sorry, say that again. I didn't catch the Pediatric question. cataract. Yeah. Because um, we know that, uh, let's say, uh, a child at two or three years old, uh, he wa we want him to be emetrope now, but later on, the eye elongates and he becomes myop. Do you have any experience with implanting two lances when he's young and then a few years later, remove the, uh, the add-on yeah. um, um, lens? Sorry, I'm not pediatric trained, so I can't answer that, but uh, uh, Dr. Gunderson? Um, I'm, I'm uh, not doing it myself either, but I know it's been done. And let's say from a principal point of view to be able to adjust uh, for the refraction development uh, during um, um, childhood uh, is a good one. But I, I don't have any personal experience and I cannot say it's so good or so good. But, but as a principal, definitely something to think about. Hi, I'm from Innsbruck, Austria. And we have found it to be really helpful for keratoplastic patients. Do you know if they want to develop a pinhole add-on sarcus lens as well? Because for irregular astigmatism, it would be nice to have like a reversible option for those cases. Great question. Uh, I don't know whether all of you heard. The question was, uh, he uses it for post corneal transplant patients, which is, which is a great indication. I didn't have a chance to cover that. I have a huge cohort of patients who have had previous uh, full thickness corneal transplants, and they come on to develop cataract surgery, and if there's issues with calculation, uh, it's a good idea to put a, a monofocal lens in the bag, stabilize the refraction, and then correct it. The second part of the question was, is there an option to develop a pinhole lens in the sulcus? I'm not sure whether First Q has that option, but there was a lens in the market which Moria acquired and now it's been removed. So unfortunately, the, there is currently no pinhole uh, secondary IOL, but there is, you know, there is a primary IOL, a small aperture IOL, uh, which could be implanted in the capsular bag. Sadi, uh, it could be um, hypothetically a good idea to use a pinhole in irregular astigmatism, but by the Hamel opinion, could reduce the contrast sensitivity. We need to take account of that, and the centration is the key. So even more than um, a diffract diffractive uh, multifocal lens. So probably we need to measure previously in our optical bank, and probably we need a very customized for each patient the aperture of the pupil, 
too much uh, things to think about that uh, go directly to a pinhole uh, in charcoal lens. I might also uh, add something to that. Um, on Friday at the Innovation uh, Symposium, Omer Karamne uh, just left the, <laughs> the room now, and they presented a, a new idea of, of making a, a, a pinhole in existing lenses. So you, you have your lens in, then you can manipulate with that optically, in, in, uh, practically in every lens. It, it is a lot of, of research to be done, but then you have the option, uh, let's say, to reduce uh, um, uh, the, the optical uh, aperture and then customize that to, to the clinical situation. This is probably one, two, three, four years uh, forward, uh, but it's a good idea and, 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 and would add to our flexibility, I guess. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, my name is Surgeon. I'm coming from Copenhagen, and I al I'm also using these lenses, and I, I maybe I implanted 50, not so many. But uh, we had uh, actually, for a couple of weeks ago, we had a problem with one patient where pressure was very high after surgery. We needed to explant this lens. Do you have some preferences uh, when to use it, uh, borderline, uh, for, uh, in uh, anterior, ch anterior chamber? What is the borderline? When to use it, where to not use it? 2.6 or this is one question. Second question, uh, is, is it pu pupil uh, size? Is it important thing? Uh, do we need to think about it? Because I think this patient had a very little pupil. Uh, that, that's why she got a pupil block. And, and the third question is, uh, is it maybe a good idea to use uh, laser ir iridotomy before surgery? To, to like to Great questions. So to answer your first part of your question, as I showed in my video, two important steps to uh, consider when considering when considering implanting these lenses are number one, preoperatively, your pseudophagic anterior chamber depth should be three millimeters and above. Measured not from the corneal epithelium, measured from the corneal endothelium to the anterior surface of the primary IOL in the capsular bag. So that gives you the true, uh, uh, if you've got a lens star, they call it aqueous depth. Uh, but not to measure from the corneal epithelium. So it, the, the, the true antechamber depth is measured from the corneal endothelium to the anterior lens surface, and that has to be three millimeters and above. If it's less than three millimeters, then there is a risk. That's one preoperative consideration. The second is intraoperative, as I demonstrated in my video. In my experience, if the OVD is not removed by lifting the add-on lens, it has happened to me when I started. I had two patients where I didn't do this. Day one post-op, pressure was 45. Patient was immediately taken back to the operating room, and we, we, we washed it, and I could see a lot of OVD stuck between the two optic surface. Remember, this is a fairly big optic, six millimeter optic. So if you don't do that step deliberately, intraoperatively, trust me, OVD gets trapped between the primary eye well in the bag and the sulcus. And once the operation is finished, when the patient starts moving, in the next 24, 48 hours, this OVD will come out and clog up the trabecular meshwork and that you will get an uh, anterior chamber uh, IOP spike. The third thing, if you have access to a true anterior segment OCT, then it would be a great idea to have all these patients preoperatively measure, get an anterior segment OCT, and now the softwares are so good. Uh, now I've got access to an anterior one from Heidelberg, no financial interest, but you could almost, the software, the new software, it automatically measures the sulcus to scleral spur to scleral spur, and that will give you a great angle anatomy. So if you see any preoperative angle crowding, even though the central anterior chamber depth is three millimeters, if it's peripherally, if the iris is bulged or if the angle anatomy is funny, then these patients may not be a good candidate. The most fourth thing which we found from the cadaver study is if the primary IOL bag complex is tilted, if the bag, even though the bag, even though the lens is in the bag, if the bag is tilted one way or the other, that would hint up the uh, secondary IOL. The secondary IOL will sit as long uniformly and horizontally as long as the capsular bag IOL complex is stable. If for any reason, if the capsular bag IOL complex is tilted on one side, then that will, that will push the IOL on that side and the iris might push, get, get pushed secondarily. So anterior segment OCT would be a great tool to have if you're considering these patients. I think these steps will give you good uh, preoperative uh, anatomy of the anterior chamber angle, which we can't see, uh, and then anterior chamber depth measurements and intraoperative 
uh, OVD removal. What about the iridotomy? Do you think that it's a good idea? Before Sorry, say that again. Iridotomy, uh, laser iridotomy before operation. The honest truth, I haven't done a single iridotomy. Okay. So uh, I don't know whether others have done, but certainly I, f I find following these principles, uh, there was no need to do a, a, a iridotomy. And the last question, just. Sorry, the pupil size. I don't think pupil size really matters. Okay. And last question: When you do you use mitomycin, uh, mitomycin uh, when you are finishing, just to see where is, is it centrated? You mean myocol? Myocol. Not mitomycin. Sorry. I don't want to use mitomycin. Myocol. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Myocol. Yeah. Uh, not to see where the lens sits, but primarily to make sure that the pupils are coming down and there is no iris capture. That's the only reason uh, I would use. I consistently use myocol or myostat, or whatever it's called, but it's intracameral astral colon to make sure that the pupils are coming down. Absolutely. Thanks. Yes, very, very short. I think that uh, we need to care in the short term uh, peaks of intracolar pressure because we need to use hyaluronato, no methyl cellulose, or dispersive viscolactic is very important, and trying to extract conscientiously uh, the viscolastic. You could have peak of intracular pressure, you need to be more conscientious that with only lens. Uh, the other thing is uh, I would like, at least in our experience, to avoid very short eye. I think that um, kids or very short eye, microphthalmos, something like that, need to be avoided, probably, as uh, Satish uh, tells us. Um, we are seeing, coming from the optical bank and the uh, clinical studies, that the behavior is quite similar, quite similar to only one lens in terms of uh, contrast sensitivity, okay, in the defocus group. So it, uh, it's not going to be this platform, uh, because of being diffractive, it's going to be less effective to the centration. We are having an excellent centration outcomes, but even the profilometry is going to be less affected. We are going to see some phacic intracular lens based on a spherical aberration that a little decentration could create coma and reduce the visual activity for distance. And this is because refractive lenses are more affected than diffractive lenses. So I think that we only need to be care in the anterior chamber anatomy, the anterior segment, very short, very shadow, that we need more and more evidence about this situation. Eyes less than 22 uh, millimeters probably. I only would want to follow up on, on Satish's comment about anterior chamber visualization. If you have access to that, that is a really valuable tool in order to understand what's going on when everything's okay, but of course also to understand what's going on when something goes wrong. Um, of course, um, it's a very expensive exp uh, equipment, and, and you shouldn't um, Avoid starting with this lens until you have it, but if you have access to it, it's an extra plus. I think we have one from on the left hand side also. Okay, no. who runs? Sorry, I forgot who came first. Yeah. We'll, we'll answer all questions. <laughs> Thank you for Go the great session. Uh, may I ask uh, if there are studies about effect on endothelial cell count of these lenses, and uh, do you consider implanting this uh, lens in cases of initial focus dy dystrophy when you see only cornea guttata with quite good cell endothelial cell count? Great questions. The, personally, I don't see uh, endothelial cell count as a, as a discriminatory factor because this lens is placed well behind the iris in the posterior chamber, but any time you go into the eye, doing a secondary procedure, you, was, you are going to lose some endothelial cells. Uh, to my knowledge, there is no published study to see where the cutoff is, uh, but if you have got access to a speckler and if you could do an endothelial cell count, there is certainly no harm. Thank you very much. And Professor, I, I, I know you had a slide, but I just couldn't read well enough. What is the maximum cylinder power in the toric version? Of uh, I, to my knowledge, off the shelf is six diopters, but I guess I might be wrong. I think, the, but they could customize. Is Laszlo here? Laszlo, what's, what's the maximum? What's the cylindrical correction, which is? Thank you. Thank you very much. There's, yeah, there's the answer. Thank you. Thank you. Shall I go? Okay. There are just two little questions. The first one is, you talk about, Dr. Gunderson, about two TAS cases. Did you relate those to the 
the, the, the presence of two lenses in the eye, or it has something to do with myocol or something else? Um, to be honest, no one knows. Um, the only thing I can say that when um, this, these, are, these two are actually the only two test uh, cases I've had in 30 years. Uh, so we learn a lot from that. And, and being, let's say, the differentiation from a clinical point of view, if you have something where you suspect enterophromitis without pain, then it's a TUS. And then you should really push on with, with the um, oral steroids in high dose from the very beginning and then supply that with. Uh, so, so let's say the, the, the reason why we, uh, we had this TUS, I cannot uh, say that for sure. It could be this, it could be this, it could be this. Um, but the, the treatment of it um, is if you, if you really don't suspect um, endophthalmitis, then go hard on, on the steroids. Um, and, and I would highlight another uh, thing because both the pressure spikes and potentially um, TUS, uh, it occurs very early on. So don't try to, to push the limits regarding the first postoperative uh, um, control to day three or day four. See them at day one or at least at day two. Satish, uh, is there a limit of days when you have high intraocular pressure? to consider taking out the uh, add-on? Or, or do you just wait to give medication and see how it delivers? So is there a limit of time that you should consider taking out the lens? I see, oh, your pardon. I see all my patients on day one post-op. So if there's an intraocular pressure spike, I know for sure it is my mistake. So I know it's OVD. OVD. So I wouldn't treat it medically because it's much quicker to take to the operating room and get it sorted straight away uh, because medical treatment would, uh, even though we measure pressure once, we don't know what the spike is going to be exactly. and we don't want to compromise uh, the optic nerve. Second part of your question, I haven't personally taken out an add-on lens because of the IOP spike. Uh, partly because of the reason I've got access to an anterior segment OCT and preoperatively if I have any doubt then I wouldn't go down this route. Uh, but I don't know whether others have taken out any lenses because of IOP spike. Um, no, the, the, the third case I, I refer to um, having a very serious uh, pressure spike that lasted for more than three days until they were, uh, were controlled. Um, they didn't consider taking it out, and it ended up um, being the, the correct solution to, to, to or the, the, the correct option, because when the pressure went down, it was stable. It's now uh, we have controlled this patient. She's down to 13 deg uh, 30 millimeters of mercury, and uh, no no um, chronic glaucoma or, or whatever. And so I think it was a wise decision again to leave the lens in. That would represent another uh, surgical trauma in a period where you don't you really cannot control the situation. So maybe it's just better to get a patient with a low pressure before you do the surgery, is that right? Like 15 or less than that before I, doing the surgery? Yeah. I think if you, sorry, may I? Yeah. If we stick to the principles of selecting the patients based on the ocular anatomy, uh, in my experience, I haven't had an intraocular pressure spike purely caused by the lens. Uh, the pressure spikes I've had two out of the, no. all, all the add-ons I have done was because of my mistake of not removing the OVD properly. Great, thank you. And, and then just a comment, I think there are two main sources to, 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 to the pressure spikes, OVD and inflammation. Peter, sorry for keeping you waiting. Just, just a comment. Uh, I implanted more or less uh, uh, 50, 50 of this uh, uh, add-on IOL. And in most of the cases, it was very, very easy and very straightforward, with an exception of uh, implantation after uh, ear laser capsulotomy, especially if the opening is very wide. I, I have a story. I, I was in the middle of a life surgery, <laughs> and I implanted an add-on IOL, and the primary IOL was dislocated. <laughs> so it was a crime. It was in, in, in a, exactly in a life surgery. <clears throat> so I, I like to suggest in case of egg laser capsulotomy, first implant the lens just into the anterior chamber. 
And after that, step by step, with a Lester hook or with a Sinsky hook, you can implant the four haptics step by step, one after the second. Thank you. That's a great point. I think if somebody is starting on using these lenses, you want to pick patients who have got a, a virgin posterior capsule. Yes, in, in this situation, from my humble opinion, I think that the key, the more problematic situation would be extracting the OVD. Extracting the OVD. So if you want to use the irrigation aspiration handle, for sure we need to reduce the bottle, okay? But probably it would be better to extract with a, a needle, injecting sueros, try to move the, the OVD instead, instead of creating pressure in this situation, that we could have some vitreous loss creating all this situation. But it's very interesting to, to have in mind that. I will just comment on, on, on the clinical situation that you really described, because with experience, then you, you, you try to do something new again. Um, as a general rule, and I think that goes more or less for every um, time you need to do a Jag laser, don't make it too big. So that's, that's the first question. See to it that you have a coverage of the optics over the um, the Jag laser op uh, opening. That will, that will help you in, in most situations. Then I completely agree with your surgical technique. If you are afraid of having, having uh, corpus um, um, coming forward, then s just take your time, implant the add-on very carefully in the, in, a, in the anterior chamber, and then step by step put in backwards. Then you avoid that sudden um, uh, surgical trauma when, when everything comes in one in, in one setting. Sorry. Yeah, I would like to just okay. So very last question, and then because we are short of time, actually we should leave the room. But we have prepared for you what uh, everybody is interested in: the user meeting at our booth when Dr. Gundersen is ready to answer any of your questions, Father. So please put the last question, and then we are going to boost uh, Medicom to boost, and we will continue with the discussion and add on user meeting. Okay, sorry for the last question. Uh, just one question, and it is uh, when you implant this lens, of course, the uh, uh, haptics uh, uh, is opening like this, down, uh, towards down, and it's very unpleasant because sometimes first haptic is going in the opening, in the capsule X opening, and sometimes both, so you need to explant. Is it maybe a good idea to, to make it retro, like you, uh, up to the endothelium? Because what's the chance to, 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 to make some? Probably this way of implanting is trying to avoid the trauma on the endothelium. It would be interesting. And I think that the key is when we are going to do, like the doctor said, bilateral, uh, the same lenses in the same uh, moment. So sometime, you, the first haptic could go to the capsular back. You need to try to see exactly if all the pieces, the, all the haptic is exactly in the sulcus, because in this moment you don't have the fibrosis in between the capsular back and the lens. So it's only to take account this moment. The other option would be to just inject it into the anterior chamber and then tuck the four haptics uh, inside rather than trying to do it. So. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, I hope you found it useful. We certainly enjoyed having you. And if you're looking for what else to do, please come and join us at the Journal of Cataract and Refractive Surgery Symposium in the Silver Hall in three minutes' time. Thank you.